and then um, at the end we can just chat and keep it keep it nice and informal. So, all right, I'm going to share my screen here. All right, how's that looking, everybody? Cool, cool. Again, thank you so much um, for attending tonight. Um, I know you probably had a long day, um, but I am Billy Beck and I'm very excited to be here today um, talking a little bit about the true value of your forest, um, kind of coming at it from an ag producer perspective. As you'll see, um, I've got a lot of experience in the Midwest and if you're a forester in the Midwest, uh, you deal with a lot of ag producers. So this is kind of tailored to them, but it's really just a general intro to forestry uh, get you start thinking about stuff. So um, again, very excited. And thank you, Michaela, for setting this up. Uh, I thank uh, the Central Iowa Extension offices for helping me promote this. Uh, I thank the DNR, uh, Joe Herring and the, and the District Forester in this area. It's part of the Working Watersheds Grant. Um, overall, we're trying to promote forestry in Central Iowa for a number of reasons, uh, water quality being a big one. Um, so yeah, again, I'm Billy Beck and um, thank you so much for being here. So again, I uh, have a lot of experience in the Midwest. So I used to be a forester in Kansas, if you can believe that. Uh, I tell folks that's a real thing. Um, but yeah, I used to be a forester in Kansas and similar to Iowa, many ag producers in Kansas, almost all of them, or, or all, the, all the landowners we dealt with, also had agricultural operations. So we'd go, we'd talk about trees, but we'd also talk about their ag operations. So I really got to become fascinated with agriculture and kind of in tune with the issues that come with trying to manage the farm and trying to manage the timber on the farm. And a lot of times the timber kind of goes by the wayside because all the other stuff going on. So one of my big goals here in Iowa is to connect agriculture and forestry because a lot of producers own a lot of acres of timber in Iowa. And I just see that it's just not being maximized. It's not reaching its full potential for a variety of reasons. Um, but again, really want to connect with agriculture and let them know that there are resources out there. You're not alone uh, as far as your forest management goals. So very excited that we, uh, we can do this tonight. This is a great example. I mean, again, this is, you know, given any given any farm, this looks like Southern Iowa. Um, there's a lot of potential there. Um, and again, in Kansas, they said that, you know, if you can't graze it and you can't row crop it, it's wasteland. They called it wasteland and it drove me crazy because there's a lot of potential there. Um, and yeah, just like, like here in Iowa, you've got this property in Southern Iowa, a lot of potential for, for this example, hardwood timber. Um, it's just not being achieved just because of, of lack of forest management for a variety of reasons. I'm not blaming anybody. There's just a variety of reasons that go into why forests are not uh, properly managed. And we'll get into some of those techniques here in a bit. But yeah, again, really striving to connect with the ag crowd. So for tonight, um, I'm not going to bombard you with a lot of technical detail. There's no way we're going to cover everything forestry in an hour. <laughs> so really, I just want to kind of get you thinking about different stuff, get some concepts on your radar, get trees in front of you and saying, you know, hey, I got that on my land or hey, I'm dealing with that issue. And then know where to get the resources to help. Know who to call, uh, know that there's resources online, uh, there's financial resources out there. So really just to get you thinking and to get you connected. And I'm still kind of new, so I want to introduce myself, get my name out there and my vision and my, my program. And again, use me as a resource. I'm a resource here. Um, I'm the extending the reach of the university. So I bring the science and the, the resources of Iowa State uh, to help folks better manage their woodlands. And then we'll get into the, the good stuff, a forestry primer. Uh, one of the biggest questions I get is what is forestry, what is forest management, and where the heck do I even start? Uh, and then we're going to visit two sites. We're going to go to an upland site and a bottomland site. And just, again, for time, I'm just going to kind of touch on some of the big questions I get uh, from landowners and some of the um, bigger things I'm concerned with as far as education and, and what's going on out there on the landscape. And I always start off with this. Um, a lot of people have some misconceptions about forestry. Um, and it's as foresters, we often kill and harvest trees. Uh, and that's perfectly okay, because we always do it in a sustainable manner that um, ensures that the next generation of forest is waiting uh, to take care of the, to take advantage of the newly made available resources 
and that that young forest, those seedlings, that regeneration is competitive against the non-desirable regeneration. So we're not just out there hacking trees and making them into lumber. We're doing it very sustainably. It's almost a science and an art combined. So again, sometimes it looks messy and we kill trees, but it's always done uh, in a sustainable way. So tonight, uh, keep an eye out for the little red trees and the little blue stars. Uh, again, we've got a ton of resources available online, uh, people resources around the state. What I'm gonna do too, is I'm gonna email you all, um, hopefully very early next week, a uh, resource guide that covers a lot of the stuff we talked about today, links for websites, people to call, uh, other information that you can use to kind of get, get started um, in managing your forests, or if you're just curious about forestry in general. And then I'll send an eval too about this program. That's really helpful to see if our message is being heard and what issues you're dealing with on the landscape. And it's so valuable that I often, um, I put y'all in a drawing for some cool forestry gear. So to encourage evaluation uh, responses. So, and then the blue stars will be forestry terms. We'll do some, we'll get into some forestry terms tonight so you can impress your friends. Um, one question I did have, and I'll ask in the follow-up session is, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty right now about meeting together, but maybe in spring, we could do a follow-up field session somewhere out in central Iowa and take this stuff out in the field, um, get to see real stuff and, and actually take measurements and kind of assess a real forest. So let me know, be thinking about if you'd be interested in that. Also, I'm promoting the Master Woodland Manager Program. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but keep, uh, keep that in your mind. And um, one question I get a lot is on windbreaks. I'm not gonna touch on those tonight for time, but I've got a Crops TV um, webinar coming up next week on the 14th, if you're interested in windbreaks, especially windbreaks that got nailed by the derecho. Um, so again, in the resource guide, I'll show you how to hook up with the Crops TV series. All right, well, if you met me after March 13th, uh, 2020, this is what I look like. Um, again, I'm new, I'm trying to get my face out there. I'm the Extension Forestry Specialist with Iowa State. I am responsible for extension and outreach uh, forestry content over all of 99 of Iowa's beautiful counties. Uh, I'm also an assistant professor in the Natural Resource Ecology and Management Department at Iowa State. So I do research and I teach classes uh, uh, in addition to the extension. We've got a really cool website. Again, resources, resources, resources. Um, check that out. It's got a lot of different things. Anything you can imagine about natural resources in there. And again, use me as a resource. There's my email. You can follow me on social media. Ask me questions that way too. So really, really quick about me. I've got a background in forestry and I've got a background in water quality and hydrology. So if you think of me, think of trees and water. Even though I cover everything about forestry in the state, I really tend to focus on trees and how they help enhance water quality. So trees and water. My vision for this position that I dreamed up has two parts and we're gonna talk about one part exclusively tonight. And that is the first, the first aspect of this. I want Iowa forests to be valued by landowners as an on-farm income and an asset, an asset to the farm enterprise. I've just seen it too much where they're disregarded um, they're degraded, they're kind of just looked over, and they're really not being maximized as a really, really powerful resource uh, for the farm enterprise. And then secondly, of course, I want to be uh, the forest to be valued by the state of Iowa for their water quality enhancement abilities and their abilities to mitigate, mitigate flooding. So, but that is a topic for another day. Okay, first term of the night. Obviously, great place to start is forestry. A lot of people have misconceptions about what forestry exactly is. Even my relatives to this day really don't know what I do. They think that I do something with trees. I went to school for trees. It, they can't wrap their heads around it. But forestry, um, as defined by the Society of American Foresters, which is our kind of home base, home group as professionals, is the science, art, and business of creating, managing, and conserving forests and associated resources in a sustainable manner to meet desired goals, needs, and values. So we manage these forested landscapes, not only to meet landowner objectives, but to meet all the societal and uh, ecosystem service uh, benefits that these forested landscapes provide. Everything from clean air, clean water, wildlife, um, soil health, um, all that great stuff. 
Um, so this spans both urban and rural. Uh, we have urban forestry in this state. We have an urban forestry or urban forest canopy in the state, which is absolutely critical uh, to all of Iowans. Um, I tend to focus 100%, really almost 100% on rural forest management. So if you got a question about um, urban forestry or uh, maybe a landscape tree, I can definitely direct you to the folks that can really be the true, true experts on that. But I tend to focus on ex almost exclusively on rural forest management. I love this slide uh, because you, you travel the, the, the country and nobody associates Iowa with trees and forestry. And many Iowans don't even associate Iowa with trees and forestry. But this is just a, such a cool picture. It's a, it's a forest, piece of forestry equipment that you would typically see in like the Pacific Northwest or in New York State or down in Alabama where there's you know big, big, big time forestry industries. Uh, but it's right here in central Iowa. And this just hammers home the point that trees and forests and forestry are definitely a part of our state. They're a part of who we are. They're a part of our history. And they're definitely a big part of our future. Um, to the tune of, you know, we've got about 3 million forest acres here, down from about 7 million in the mid-1800s. 150,000 forest landowners, 10 to $35 million in standing timber sold every year. This should be way higher, and we'll get into that in a bit. Uh, 24,000 jobs, 4.3 billion economic input output uh, from that study back in 2016. Uh, the highest quality white oak and black walnut on earth. Um, and this is the best one I think is Iowa State is one of the oldest forestry programs in the country. Not the Midwest, but the entire country. So I think that's really, really cool. So if you've got a young person or maybe an older person that's like me that went back to school kind of later in life, uh, and they're interested in forestry, please have them call me. Uh, Iowa State's got a great program, we can talk. So, and again, all the other great impacts to soil, water, aesthetics, recreation, pollinators, general relaxation, a um, lot of good things come out of these, these, these landscapes. So really the, the true value is kind of up to you. Um, the value that you see in your landscape, that you see in your woodlands is, is up to you. Is it monetary? Is it wildlife? Is it aesthetics? Is it a place to just go and relax? Is it pollination? Is it water quality? Is it stream bank stabilization? Or is it a combo of all of them? So really the, the true value is not just dollars. It's, it's, really, um, it's really up to the landowner to, to define that value. All right, so I've zoomed in here to a, I don't know, maybe not a typical, but a, a central Iowa farm. If this is your farm, uh, you deserve a special prize. I, I randomly selected this. So if, if this is actually your spot, let me know, we can, we can get a, a, a nice forestry prize for you. This is a, just a cool kind of example of the, the potential that forestry holds on farms, even here in central Iowa, there's, there's you know, very fertile soil, a lot of acres in ag production. If you look around this area, you know, you've got homestead windbreaks, you've got fence rows, you've got odor mitigation, visual mitigation plantings around the confinement areas. Down by the river, you've got floodplain or riparian forests. There's another term for tonight is riparian. Riparian is essentially um, anything that borders water, a body of water. So when I'm talking about riparian tonight, it's basically any forest that borders our streams and rivers. And then we've got upland, upland forests too. Um, and one of the places I love is that, and landowners often kind of struggle with, are these odd areas. You know, maybe that the soil is poor, there's bad drainage there, um, it floods a lot, you don't get a lot of good cropping years out of these areas, just these oddball areas that are often, you know, perfect places uh, for tree planting. So um, it, just this, is, this random map of central Iowa shows you all the potential that exists um, for forestry on the farm and to be an asset to the farm enterprise. So I love this picture. Um, Again, a lot of people, the first thing they ask me is, where do I even start? I've got this big ag operation. I don't have any time. I've got six kids. Um, I can't even ID a tree. Uh, I don't even know who to call. Um, what do I eat? Where do I even start to do? Uh, and this is a cool example. I met this family um, at a watershed stakeholder meeting. They were interested in water quality. They've got a big row crop cattle operation, but they were... Uh, interested in water quality because, you know, the whole, you know, doing the right thing, but they were also losing a lot of land to stream bank erosion. Um, so they were looking to stabilize that land with tree plantings. 
so I got to talking with them like, okay, where do I start? Where do I start? Where do I start? And I really always tell people to, before you do anything is to really start with a vision, get out on the landscape and just think, what do you want out of this land? What do you visualize? Even if you don't know all the forestry terms and what a, what DVH means and all this other stuff, just get out there and really start visualizing. What do you want? Do you want timber income? Do you want water quality benefits, wildlife? Do you just want a general aesthetic uh, beauty on the landscape? Which one of these or all of them do you, do you want? And for these folks, it was, it was these four up here. They wanted timber, water quality, wildlife aesthetics, and they were able to manage them all on the same land, which was, which was really, really cool. So again, kind of up at the top, those little mini pictures there, on the website, uh, myself, the, the professional foresters in the state, we all have resources to help you meet any and all of those, those objectives. A really cool one, the third picture there is the Iowa Tree Farms uh, Program and the Iowa Woodland Owners Association. Really cool peer-to-peer -peer kind of learning and networking uh, groups there. So you get to see, meet a lot of great people, see what they're doing, uh, learn from them, and then and show them what you're doing on, on your land as well. This was a cool picture. This was a fun day. This was the dad, the son, and the grandpa out there all, all planting trees. The next thing I, I just encourage is to get out there and explore your woods. And I say this, it sounds very simple, but um, I can't tell you how many folks I meet with that say, well, I've never been down, I haven't been down there in 10 years. So that, that, that spot down by the river, I, somebody hunts down there, but I, I haven't been down there in 10 years. Like this, there's just some spots in the landscape where folks just don't go. And they really don't know what's going on. Is there, you know, invasive species? Is, has there been timber theft? You know, you just don't know what's going on out there unless you get out there and kind of explore a little bit. And I encourage folks to start by kind of just mapping it out. And this does not have to be complicated at all. You can be a simple notebook, pad of paper, rough drawing up to, you know, some of the cool mapping apps on your smartphones. And there's a lot of young foresters in the state that are more than willing to show you uh, how to do some cool mapping with some pretty simple smartphone apps. But just start mapping stuff out or getting an idea of, of where it's at, the property boundaries, the access points, the roads. What's the current and past land use? Did you graze it up to 20 years ago? Um, where are the streams, the water bodies at? Topography, the soils, what are the soils like? Uh, are there potential tree planting sites that you might be looking at? Um, again, this can be super simple and super complex and you can get help. This is kind of where I say to bring in bring in the pros and uh, you're going to hear me talk about this all night and that's working with a professional forester. It's absolutely critical for your success. They're going to be your guide. Um, again, you don't have to do this all alone, but I really encourage people to get out and just kind of explore their woods before talking to anybody just to see it through their own eyes before you start learning all the terms and all the, the science stuff behind it. But again, professional foresters, they are gonna be your absolute critical resource in anything you do on the landscape. Evaluate and identify. This is challenging, but again, I encourage folks to go out there, start learning what's growing in your woods. Uh, start seeing what trees are out there. How big are they? How tall are they? How old do you think they are? Uh, what condition are they in? Do they look like they're vigorous? Are they crowded? Are they kind of fighting for resources and stagnating? Um, what's the next generation of forests? Is, is it species that you want or is it invasive species that you don't want? Um, is there disease out there? You know, there's some oak wilt leaves right there. Um, is there downed wood? What kind of wildlife's out there? Erosion and gullying, that's a big one that impacts forest management that I see a lot, especially emanating, you know, coming out of field tiles and cutting through woodlands. We see these massive gullies that really impede access and mobility and just general forest management. So again, get out there and start learning uh, what you got. And again, the professional foresters definitely are gonna be your guide and, and to, to help you with this, but it's really cool. Um, there's a lot of resources out there to just start learning stuff. And when people start learning stuff, they get more and more and more excited. So it's, it's really neat to see them um, kind of first discover, you know, what tree species they got out in their woods. And then this is the part where I think is the absolute um, critical starting point for anything that you're going to do. And this is where the forester really comes in. And that's the development of a forest management plan. Um, this is your guide. These are absolutely critical to maximize the return 
from your woodlands. Um, these take into account your objectives, the site, what resources you have available to you, everything. And it's your guide to achieve uh, those objectives. These can take many forms. There's not just this one form for the whole world to do a forest management plan. But again, working with a professional forester, um, they're gonna create these for you. They're gonna work with you to execute them. And again, like a realtor, they're gonna kind of be your guide uh, as you work towards your forest uh, management objectives. A lot of times when you're uh, involved in a program, like a financial assistance program, like the Conservation Reserve Program or the Environmental Quality Incentives Program or EQIP, they're gonna require a plan for that practice. So there's a lot of different forms of plans out there, but the point is have a plan. It's gonna be so helpful. Um, a great example of this was the derecho. Um, this is a, a, a woodland in Lynn County, almost complete destruction. But if you don't have that plan, it's kind of like, what the heck do I do? Now this happened, what, what in the world do I do? I don't even know what I got. I don't even know what I was shooting for. What do I do now? Uh, but if you've got that plan, you can fall back on it and kind of say, okay, let's reassess. These were my objectives. Now we're back here. Where do we go from here? So it just makes decision making so much easier when you've, when you've got this plan. It'll tell you the timing of management practices, where to do it, because you're going to have a really nice map associated with this plan, uh, when to harvest, where to harvest. All these things go together to meet, meet your objectives. Um, it's going to encourage you to, this is why I love these, it's going to really encourage you to monitor and evaluate and be adaptive in your management. It's going to encourage you to go out there in the woods and say, okay, this should look like this, but it looks like this. So what do we do about that? and just kind of be, use adaptive management, get you out there to really get your eyes on the ground more often. And it makes folks really engaged and curious and passionate uh, when they've got that plan and they continue to learn and work with the forester. So step one, um, after doing it kind of on your own and getting your vision together, get with a forester and, and create that plan. All right, well, let's hop around here. Let's get up in the uplands, the upland forests. Um, just talk about some quick characteristics, what you might find here, and two of the big questions and big concerns that I have um, with upland forests, especially associated with, with ag, ag landowners and, and their farm uh, enterprises. <clears throat> so in the uplands, obviously, these are forests that um, inhabit the upper topographic regions of the landscape, but they're, they're different. Even in the uplands, forests change uh, in the kind of species that are there, the structure, uh, their function, they all kind of change as you move around. It's not this homogenous blanket on the landscape. And they shift, they change for a lot of reasons. Uh, you're gonna see certain tree species in certain sites for a definite reason. Uh, it depends on soils, it depends on the position of the landscape. Aspect is a big one, what, what, what direction the, the slope uh, is facing. Past and present land use, has it been grazed heavily? Uh, has it been, fire has been excluded heavily in the past? Um, again, disturbance history, fire grazing, uh, time too. Uh, forest change over time. Many people think that this forest is a forest with big trees and open park-like um, appearance, but that's simply not the case. They're always changing um, through time. But a really cool example of why you see different species uh, on upland sites is the concept of aspect. And I love this picture. We're definitely not in the uplands, we're on a river, but it's just the coolest picture to show how aspect influences site conditions and then how that influences what trees can compete best on a north facing slope or a south facing slope or an east facing slope or a west facing slope. So this is a, a small creek in central Iowa. You can see uh, the west facing slope just like you know, anywhere in the Boone River Valley that's, that's got a lot of topography, has way more direct sunlight, uh, way uh, lower soil moisture in general, uh, generally higher temperatures. Uh, and you can see that right here, clear as day in this picture. Look on the east facing slope where we receive much less direct sunlight. We've got way higher soil moisture, um, cooler temperatures, and um, just a general shady condition. We still got ice there. So uh, when you're walking around um, in central Iowa, kind of look at this and see, okay, what side are we on and why 
um, are we seeing these specific trees on that site? And a really cool, um, I know I'm biased here, but a really cool um, resource to view this and learn more about this, this the, the forests of, of Iowa, and it's central Iowa in particular. Uh, we did a, a virtual field day back in October in the Boone River Valley. And it's archived online, it'll be in the resource sheet, but check it out. You can probably just do an internet search for touring Iowa's forests with the Iowa Learning Farms. And we go over all this stuff, we hop around a landscape and show you all the cool forests that we uh, exist in central Iowa. But again, a lot of those uh, site conditions influence the species that you're gonna see in your upland forests. So for example, let's take a sunny south or west facing slope. We're gonna see it dominated by sun-loving, shade-intolerant species. And that's another forestry term uh, in general. Shade-intolerant means that these species cannot tolerate shade very well. They do not photosynthesize very effectively in shade at all. They can probably get established and hang on for a little bit, but once they get overtopped, they're just not going to do very well in that shady environment. So they tend to compete better, thus dominate, south and west facing slopes where it's more direct sunlight, lower soil moisture, a little bit higher temperatures. So things like red oak, white oak, chinkapin oak, shagbark and bitternut hickory, black cherry, a little bit of eastern red cedar around the margins there. And then sometimes you hop 20 feet over the ridge to a north or east facing slope where it's much less direct sunlight, lower soil moisture, lower temperatures, and you see a lot of things like basswood, black maple and ironwood, which are shade tolerant. So they can tolerate the shade. They can compete very effectively in the shade because they photosynthesize at a, a pretty good rate in shaded conditions. So even if you're walking around the upland forest, it's gonna differ by sight. So keep your eyes open for that when you're walking around your property. Like why is this tree species right here on this site? And what does that mean for, for future management? And again, another resource alert, uh, we've got a really neat tree and shrub ID key online on our website. So it's interactive. It can help you ID uh, the trees you see out there on, on your place. And then we got encyclopedia articles, not as boring as you think. They're just kind of one page web, web, web articles um, that kind of follow up and give additional information about those tree species that you ID you know, on your place. All right, so let's get into some of the big concerns that I have, but landowners are dealing with in, 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 as far as their upland forests. And it's invasive species is almost the first thing that I see whenever I go out to someone's place. Uh, and these are everywhere. They're not just in upland forests, but it's a big deal uh, in upland forests, especially when we're trying to regenerate things that love sun, like oak and other species. Uh, so as foresters, we manage light. So trees need light and they need nutrients and they need water. But in Iowa, we got pretty darn fertile soils and we have pretty ample rainfall. So really light is a big factor as far as competition, which trees are gonna live and which trees are not gonna live. So a lot of times we manipulate light um, to um, ensure that certain species grow, the species that we want, and certain species don't grow, the species that we don't want. So what do invasive species do? Um, they have very low uh, natural predators they leaf out early, they drop their leaves late, which gives them a longer growing season. They just have all these competitive advantages over the native, native species. So they really tend to dominate areas that they get into and they completely block sunlight from getting to the forest floor. So this really impacts the next generation of forest. Nothing can establish under these things. Uh, and when the forest dies, the older trees die, which they will, um, what's going to be left to take their place? It's going to be these invasive species, things like honeysuckle, European buckthorn, and the garlic mustard. This was the craziest garlic mustard year I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> 2020 was. It was incredible how much garlic mustard was just even around Ames here. Um, this is, you can see how frightened I am there. It was a scary situation. So, but again, I really can, uh, um, every site is so different. Uh, tackling these on your site is going to be different than tackling it elsewhere, but we've got a really great um, invasive species webpage, which has all kinds of uh, information on how to ID these things. We've got some cool videos on how to ID them, uh, managing them, chemical, physical management, removal of these things. 
Um, native alternatives, especially to, to, to put in your landscaping around your house. A lot of these things are escaped former landscaped uh, plants, but really cool resource there. So that's kind of the first thing I say when you're, when you're walking your woods is look at what invasive species are there. And a great time to do that is in spring because they leaf out before anything else. So you're gonna see this carpet of green um, and pretty uh, good chance if it's early, it's gonna be an, an invasive species. So it's, this is so challenging. Uh, the infestations are so big. Um, a lot of times I tell folks, hey, find an area that's not that bad yet and keep that area not that bad, make it a little bit better and then worry about the completely infested areas later. But big, big concern, learn how to ID these um, when you're out walking around. All right, I know it's very late for a graph, so I apologize. But this is the only graph I've got in this talk. Um, jump into the next big thing, and that's what I get asked all the time, is how do I sell my timber? Uh, what's involved in a timber sale? Um, I'd like to sell my timber and start thinking about it. Big, big, big question. A question not to be taken lightly at all. Uh, and that's what this kind of graph shows you. Um, it's unfortunately a lot of times in Iowa um, or the Midwest in general, you get a knock on the door, somebody's logging your neighbor or somebody's logging down the road, they're just driving through. They say, hey, can I check your timber out? We're in the area. And they come back later saying, hey, I'll give you, you know, 20,000 bucks or hey, let's cut these things down and we'll sort out a deal later. That's absolutely not the way to go about this. A lot of thought, and again, that forest management plan is gonna be your guide here, but a lot of thought should go into timber sales because if it doesn't, you're not gonna see the return uh, that you really deserve from your timber. Remember I said the 10 to 35 million a year, that should be way higher uh, because I think people sell at the wrong time and they're just not doing it correctly. But this graph basically shows that uh, in general, as trees get older, their growth slows down. So the volume they're adding every year slows down. So your annual rate of return, the value that they're providing to you by sitting out in the woods there goes down uh, over the years. So that's kind of dealing with what's called financial maturity, which is our next forestry term here. And that's different than biological maturity for a tree. Um, a biological mature tree is a tree that's about to die. So is that the right time to harvest? Um, probably not. And again, this scenario is, is, is um, assuming that you have economics in your forest management objective. But as trees get older, their growth slows down, the rate of return to you slows down. So financial maturity, again, is a great time to cut. You need to know when it's financially mature. That is when the growth rate or the annual rate of return of that tree sitting in the woods is equal to an alternative investment that rate of return from an alternative investment. So if you went out and you cut down that tree, put the cash in your pocket and then went and invested it elsewhere into another option you had, um, that rate would be of return would be equal. So for example, a financially immature tree, say 14 inches uh, diameter breast height, which is about 4.5 feet above the ground, uh, 14 inch diameter tree, which is just creeping into harvestable range, um, may, if it's a fast growing tree, if you go up and to the left, may provide you about 8% return uh, every year in value. And again, this is a very general, just kind of guideline graphic here. So say your alternative investment is 4.5%. Well, you're financially immature because that tree is giving you a lot more increase in value every year by sitting it, by keeping it in the woods than it would be by harvesting. So now let's go out in the future. This tree is now 26 inches in diameter, which is a nice size for a harvest. Um, that return rate is now down to about 4.5%. It's just not putting on volume as fast as it was at one point. So now that equals whatever rate of return uh, for your alternative investment may be. So that thing is getting to be financially mature. So it's ready to harvest. Uh, beyond that, if it's getting bigger, it's putting on even less value per year, and now you're at a risk of loss. You're overmature. You're at a risk of loss from lightning, uh, insects and pathogens, timber theft, winds, the derecho. So you're, you're, you're really having a risk out there, uh, leaving it out there uh, when you're not getting that big of a return. So don't get too wrapped up in this graph here. The point is there's a lot that goes into the timing of a harvest, and it shouldn't just be done 
at the drop of a hat if somebody knocks on your door. So again, the forester in that plan is gonna ensure that you harvest at the right time, not only to maximize the economics, but to maximize all the other objectives you've got. Is it a good time to harvest for wildlife or water quality or you know, um, recreation? So again, timber sale is a big deal and don't take it lightly. Here's another cool um, little, little table here that um, reinforces that timing matters uh, when you're talking about timber harvest. Another term here is uh, veneer quality timber versus say what I'll call lumber quality timber. So a veneer quality timber tree is a perfect tree. It's straight, it's got minimal defects on all four sides of the trunk. It is very, very high quality. And what veneer is, they'll slice that wood incredibly thin, you know, almost a 1 36th of an inch. Um, and then obviously put it over lower quality wood to make nicer furniture. So very, very valuable trees if you've got veneer quality trees versus a lumber tree. The thing about harvesting these trees though is over time, not only does the tree get bigger with veneer quality logs, but the price per board foot gets bigger. So the price you're gonna get for a unit of volume of that wood gets bigger. Whereas a lumber quality tree, yeah, the tree gets bigger over time, but the price per volume stays the same. And that's another uh, cool forestry term you can impress your friends with is uh, the board foot. It's a volume of wood that's 12 by 12 by one inch thick. So that's how timber is sold and, and valued. Or, excuse me, is sold and kind of um, placed a value upon. So with veneer quality timber, the tree gets bigger and big, big veneer trees are incredibly valuable. So not only does the volume increase, but the price per volume increases too. So if you're looking here at 18 inch diameter, um, veneer quality tree has about 122 board feet in that tree. It's worth about $4 per board foot. So that tree is worth about 488 bucks. Fast forward about, you know, um, they put on, I'd say there's about 10, 10 year intervals between this kind of diameter growth here. So fast forward to 26 diameter, that's a big, nice veneer log. Now we've got 281 board feet, but the price per board foot, because that log is so big, it's 11 bucks. So that tree is now at $3,091 of, of total value. So again, if somebody's knocking, how do you really know, is it time to sell? Are you getting the maximum return uh, from the trees out there? And this was the cur courtesy of uh, Gary Beyer, who's a consulting forester and who's formerly with the Iowa DNR. And I get this question all the time, um, what's this tree worth? And it is very tough to answer that question. We're walking in the woods, people say, what's this tree worth? What's that tree worth? It's almost impossible to say what an individual tree was worth because so many factors go into valuating that tree. And it all really comes down to who is cutting that tree down. Uh, Gary Beyer, the guy that just put, uh, provided that table, he said, the tree is worth what somebody is willing to pay you for it. So again, if you get six loggers on site, you're gonna get six vastly different bids for your timber. Not because one's trying to cheat you or one's feeling very generous that day. It just all comes down to a lot of different factors that they're dealing with. Overhead, distance from mills. Um, some may have a really uh, high demand for a certain species that you've got while others don't. Uh, so they're gonna put a, a higher price on that, a higher bid on that sale than someone else would. Um, maybe the site is difficult to access and they don't have the right equipment. So it's gonna cost them more time and more money. So again, wildly different bids um, if, if you look at, at timber sales. So that's why it's so critical. And we'll get that in a sec uh, onto um, getting multiple bids for your timber sales. And just for fun, this is a definitely a veneer quality log. This fixture does not do it justice, but um, this tree was valued. It's, it's perfect. It's a freak of nature. I hate, I hate showing this because 99% of walnuts aren't like this. This perfect anyway, and this big, but this tree was valued at 56,000 uh, bucks. It's, it's completely perfect. It's huge uh, veneer quality log, but 56,000 bucks for that one tree up in Clayton County. But we do have some averages. Um, this is courtesy of Gretchen Klein, who's a private consulting forester out of Henry County. Um, these are general woods run prices for standing timber, again, by the board foot, so 12 by 12 by one. Um, we have a clear leader, 
and black walnut. Again, we grow some of the best black walnut on earth. So uh, uh, same with white oak. Um, bur oak, maples were getting down. You know, red oak was in the tank for a while. It's, 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 it's gaining uh, again, which is good. Uh, even silver maple, you know, you wouldn't think a silver maple is a high quality timber tree, but along our larger rivers, some bigger trees, bigger harvests uh, can get you a, a nice return there. So again, we got a range of stuff. Um, all these trees have value in the big picture, but this is kind of the average dollar value per board foot uh, that we're seeing. And again, a lot goes into it. Um, these timber buyers, they almost have x-ray vision. These are two timber buyers we had out to talk to the students. Uh, they can see defects in that log that we can't. And they can say, okay, there's a defect here. It's going to devalue this tree this much. Or, wow, there's no defects here. Um, this, is a, this is a great tree. So really cool to go out in the woods with, with these kind of folks. They almost have x-ray vision. All right, real quick. Um, how am I doing on time here? All right. Um, timber harvest do's and don'ts. Real quick, again, we've got a resource for this. Um, the Iowa DNR has a great forestry webpage. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll share this in the resource guide. But do, 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 do work with a forester. Uh, call before you cut. They're going to maximize the value that you get from that harvest. They're going to work with you to mark the trees. They're going to help you solicit bids. They're going to help ensure that the harvest is done on time. Uh, within reason, you know, weather comes into, into play there. But ensure the harvest is done. Um, you know, to protect other residual trees, not to rut up roads, not that anybody's looking to do that, but they're gonna be your guide through this whole process. And again, the harvest should be part of a management plan. Uh, if you don't have a plan, how do you know what you're selling and how do you know if it's even ready to sell? So that plan is just absolutely critical. And always work with a bonded timber buyer. To buy timber from a landowner in this state, you have to be bonded and there's a list and we can provide that list. It's up on the DNR website. Uh, so check them out. If, if you're looking to work with somebody, check them out on the timber buyer, the bonded timber buyer list. Um, and a timber buyer versus a forester, it's, it's a good, it's, there's a term there. A forester is really someone who is working with you to, uh, to achieve your forest management objectives and do it sustainably over the long term, um, all the while um, looking out for things like forest health, um, wildlife, all the other objectives you've got out there including harvest, which may be part of your plan. Whereas the timber buyer is, sim is someone who is purchasing and marketing uh, timber from a landowner. So both critical professions, there's just a, a definite um, difference in them that I, that I think folks should know. And then again, get sealed bids, get everything in writing and sell it when it's standing. Don't cut and work out the details later. But that sealed bid, that's really gonna get you the maximum true value uh, of your timber out there. Don't, again, don't sell on the spur of the moment. Go back to your plan, take your time, do your research. Uh, don't high grade. Uh, again, working with a forester, this isn't gonna be an issue, but high grading is where you go in and you cut down all the big, nice trees. So you basically remove all the genetics in one big swoop and you're kind of one and done, that your future generations are not gonna reap that value like, like, you, like you had. So don't high grade. Kind of similar, don't sell on a diameter limit. Say, okay, come in and take everything over 14 inches. Um, again, condition dictates harvest timing. It all goes back to your plan. Um, I won't get into this too much, but don't sell on shares. Um, just keep that term in your head. If you ever hear the term selling on shares, um, make that be a big red flag. It really doesn't reflect the logging cost to the value of the trees. Um, I just put it in here to, to, to share that term with you. Okay, um, for time. I will zip through these. Um, I could talk all night, um, but let's get down by the river. So riparian forests, again, um, a lot of cool potential down here, especially in these odd areas. I love these little odd areas next to creeks that aren't giving you the best cropping return and would be a great place to plant some trees. Um, big concern that I have when I look at, at what's going on and, and what folks are struggling with is they often overlook the planning aspect. Um, again, going back to the plan, but planning, everybody gets excited in spring. I want to go out and plant some trees. Um, you really have to think these through and say, okay, what are the site factors? That's the first thing you should probably look at. Okay, what are the soils like? And again, really cool resource. 
Uh, NRCS has a web soil survey. You can look up the soils on your property and you can look up um, using a, a publication that I'll put in the resource guide too, what tree species will grow best there. So I get a ton of calls saying, you know, I want this tree. I want this tree species in my planting. And you look up the soils that just doesn't match. So you really got to consider uh, the site factors there and match the species to the site. Site prep is often overlooked and I can't tell you how critical this is. Uh, you've got to prep the site and I'm talking about the condition of the soil and really competing vegetation. Uh, will the soil conditions promote long-term tree growth and survival? Like we had a lot of plow pans where I was working in Kansas that restrict root growth. So we had to go in there and rip them up before we planted trees in there. Uh, making the soil conditions ideal for your chosen planting technique. Is the equipment going to plant those trees correctly the way the soil is now? And one of the biggest things is competing vegetation. Cool season grass especially, you've got to get that under control before you put the, the young seedlings in there. And this can be a multi-year effort, but again, site prep is absolutely critical. So planting. Um, I'll be kind of quick here for time. There's a lot of different ways to plant. Two cool ways that I really like are direct seeding and seedling establishment. So direct seeding on the left is you just broadcast or you plant the actual tree seed, the acorn, um, the walnut. Seedling establishments where you actually go in and put seedlings down using a tree planter or a planting bar. Um, but advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, you talk about site prep and competing vegetation. Direct seeding gives you an almost instant canopy, thousands of stems per acre. And not only does that control competing vegetation, but that forces the trees to grow up nice and straight, uh, if, especially if you're looking for like lumber value in the future, you're gonna have a defect free um, stem there. Seedling establishment takes a little bit more work on the front end because you've got big gaps, you're gonna be controlling weeds more, um, but on the back end, you're going to be doing a lot less work with seedling establishment because you're going to have easy access to the rows of trees when you need to thin them. And for example, direct seeding, if you've got to come in there and thin those in eight to 10 years, it's going to be, it's going to be a little tough. So again, every site is different, depends on your objectives. Um, maintenance. This is absolutely critical. You, you can't just put the trees in the ground and walk away. Um, you've got to protect them. You've got to keep that competing vegetation. You got to get the deer under control. Here's two really neat kind of examples of maintenance. Three years is critical. Um, the one on the left, we used a cover crop to uh, kind of keep down the competing vegetation and we used tree shelters or tree tubes to prevent uh, from deer browse. On the right, we use mowing and tree shelters. And this looks a little messy. Uh, with the rows, but those weedy species in there really protect against deer browse and they kind of keep a nice moist environment in there that, that protect the young seedlings. So a lot of different ways, but be sure you're out there maintaining these things. Here's a really cool direct seeding example from Des Moines County. It's literally a carpet of oaks. So as you can see, this is really helpful for uh, preventing, um, you're really just outnumbering the deer. They can't get all these and they can even barely even walk into it. So cool, cool thing. All right, well with that, um, again, that was kind of a crash course, but I just wanted to get you thinking about stuff and thinking about, okay, what's going on on my land? And is there a resource out there um, that could help me achieve my goals? And I bet you there is. Uh, I'll provide a sheet again, um, start with our website, start with the DNR website. We've got professional forester contacts, contractor contacts, the folks that can actually do the planting and herbicide treatment and whatnot, timber buyer lists, technical resources, information on cost share programs, all kinds of good stuff. And again, use me too. So now I will task you to get out in the woods and create your vision, start thinking about stuff if you haven't already. Um, if you've already got a plan, that's awesome. Uh, keep working on it. Tell me about it, call me. I love to hear what folks are doing. Um, but if nothing else, get with your forester and, and start talking about this stuff. So in the future, start thinking about and contact Michaela or myself. Do you want to have a, maybe a spring woods walk with tonight's session? If things kind of calm down and we can kind of get together safely in distance, um, let's do it. Uh, also, the Master Woodland Manager Program, a very deep dive into forestry, all things forestry, uh, from ID and tree planting to harvest and taxes and everything in between. We're going to be hosting that in Central Iowa later this spring. It's seven weeks. It's not every day, seven weeks. It's like once a day and we have like some field sessions on the weekends, but think about that. 
Also, um, free trees for folks in these counties. Free tree seedlings eligible. This is first come, first serve. So uh, contact Joe Herring, who is your district forester, if you live in these counties, uh, for your free tree seedlings. And again, we've got resources on how to plant these. Joe can work with you. Uh, he's amazing. So uh, yeah, you can't beat that with a stick. No pun intended. But um, call me. I love to get out in central Iowa. I love gator rides. I love to see what y'all are doing, your successes, what you're struggling with. So please give me a holler. Uh, and I'd love to get out at your place when I can. So with that, thank you a million. Um, again, use me as a resource. I really appreciate your time tonight. Uh, you've had a long day. And I just, uh, I'm glad you're interested in the forest resources of Iowa. So Michaela, again, thank you for hosting. Um, we don't have a heck of a lot of time for questions. I apologize, but hammer them off. And again, uh, shoot me an email if, if you've got them. So, and Michaela can also maybe give me the chat box um, and I can kind of respond that way too, so. Yes, absolutely. So if you, anyone has any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself and ask them out loud. This is the time to ask any of your questions. Um, a question I'm sure a lot of people have on their minds, but maybe a little scared to ask. Um, so there's a lot of tree and forest damage in the storm in August. What type of resources, assistance programs are available for that? Yeah, oh my gosh, uh, especially here in central Iowa. Um, even I'm still cleaning up in my yard. Like I can't imagine a forest landscape cleanup effort. But yes, there are resources. Um, one that has passed, unfortunately, was the Emergency Forest Restoration Program. I'm not gonna even get into that because it's passed. But um, EQIP and um, REAP are two really great um, financial assistance programs. EQIP is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. REAP is the Resource Enhancement and Protection Program. Anyway, they can provide cost share assistance for kind of cleanup activities and getting your forest back to kind of where it was. Obviously, you're not gonna put giant trees back in place, but it can help you with replanting. It can help you with protecting those young seedlings. It can help you with debris cleanup um, and brush removal. Um, it can help you with um, site prep if you need to, to replant. So um, the first thing I tell folks is to get with your USDA service center in your county and just ask them about programs. The, the Farm Service Agency or the, uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, and your district forester. They're both going to know um, what programs are appropriate for you. But yeah, um, and then we've got a really cool storm recovery web page on our website that I'll include in the resource guide. Kind of lets folks know, okay, is this damage, does this damage warrant removing the tree or not? What should I do now? Because every site is so different. Um, some places got completely destroyed. Others, you know, got some snap tops and stuff. But um, yes, so there's technical resources online. Your district forester or your professional consulting forester is a great resource. And then talk to your service center about programs like EQIP and REAP that can help kind of uh, get you back on track. So. Wonderful. Robin would like to know if you have any information about windbreaks. Mm. Yes. Um, what kind of info? Again, um, I didn't touch on it too much tonight. I'm doing a what's called the Crops TV series, which is like 50 different ag extension folks talking about topics all winter long. So check that out. Um, just do an internet search for crops TV. But um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's programs out there too to uh, help you rebuild your windbreaks and renovate your windbreaks. Again, equip and reap. Reap is very common, commonly used with uh, windbreak renovation. So, um, but yeah, we've got, we've got windbreak publications, um, species recommendations. So all kinds of good stuff there you go. And a lot of windbreaks on the landscape are kind of older and they need renovating. So I'm glad you asked that. I think more, more interest in windbreaks needs to, needs to be, so. Perfect. Okay, Dan says he has a family farm in central Iowa with a lot of old growth ash. What are some suggestions moving forward? They are border trees. They are border trees? Yes, border. Like a fence row? Okay. I would assume so. I mean, um, 
again, every site's different, but I'd just start say, you know, think about other species that you would like to manage for because those are most likely on their way out at this point. Um, a lot of times if you see the bark flaking off, that's evidence that woodpeckers are getting in there going after the larva. You see a lot of what they call stump sprouts or epicormic branching, you know, sprouts coming out of the, the base of the tree that really don't look like they should be there. That's a good sign of emerald ash borer. But yeah, I would start looking, you know, ash is a great firewood. Um, it's got some value there, but I would look at starting to maybe get those out and um, start managing for some more desirable species. And then plant diverse. Um, I know ash is very common in our cities. It's very common in our woodlands. We're gonna lose a big, big component there, but mix it up. Don't really plant one species heavily because who knows what's gonna come along next, the next emerald ash borer. So mix it up, not only species, but size and diversity. It, it, it's all good when you've got a, a mixed bag there. Um, but yeah, we've got a great publication on alternatives to ash. Um, but yeah, it, it's hard to say without seeing the site, but just thinking about different species that you would, that are gonna meet your objectives, that would work on your soils, um, and then start maybe whittling away at those ash, start opening up, you know, if you've got adequate regeneration, start opening that canopy up and getting the sunlight in there. But I would, again, work with a, call your forester up and just see what they think too, so. Wonderful, does anyone else have any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and speak up or go ahead and type them in the chat box. Well, if we don't have any more, Billy, is there anything else you'd like to plug in here? Um, gosh, I'm just like uh, self-serving plugs here, but um, just if you're interested in stuff like this, we've got a kind of a, an events um, update on our website. Um, in March, we're going to be doing a kind of week-long series that's replacing a larger conference. We're going to do it virtually. It's called the Tri-State Forest Stewardship Conference, but that's going to have a lot of cool stuff about oak management. Um, we're having like an oak theme this year um, and a heavy theme on wildlife and pollinators. So that's coming up in March. It's free, so um, it's going to be like two talks a day for like four days. So but keep, keep checking that. And then um, if y'all are interested in doing a follow-up woods walk, um, keep your eye out for that eval email. And um, I'll have a question there, would you be interested? And let's do that. Again, if you're interested in the Master Woodland Manager Program, that's kind of that deeper dive into forestry, um, everything from ID to taxes. Um, we're gonna be hosting that in Central Iowa, probably in around May. Hopefully at that point we can get together um, but yeah, we've got a lot of cool upcoming events. So uh, again, use me as a resource. Give me a shout. Let me know what you're doing on your land. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, I'll try my best to answer them. If I can't, I will get you to somebody that can. So I can't thank y'all enough for coming. Um, it's exciting to talk about forestry um, in, in, in Iowa here and in the Midwest and connecting with the ag crowd. So um, Michaela, thanks for hosting. And um, yeah, email Joe for your free trees. So Yes, absolutely. And if you have any questions that you think of later, feel free to email Billy. His email is right there on the screen. Otherwise, feel free to email me and I can definitely get them to him. And that's what we're here for. We're your resource. So, yeah. All right. And There's winter is the best time to get in the woods. So that's my, that's my final thought there. My last thing I want to say, it's, <laughs> it's cold, but you can see there's no snakes. There's no ticks. Um, I like snakes. There's no ticks. Um, but yeah, it's a great time to actually see the condition of the trees is the winner. So get out there and, and enjoy. So thank you all so much. I appreciate it. So Yes, wonderful. Everyone enjoy the rest of your night and thanks for joining us.